This is a revision video for AQA GCSE Chemistry or Combined Science, looking at Unit 8, the Chemical Analysis Unit, which is all about how we can identify unknown substances. You can download the questions from the description below and use these to test whether you can recall the key facts listed in the specification before you move on to questions which ask you to analyse or apply your knowledge or evaluate. The first part of Unit 8 is about pure substances, which in chemistry means a single element or compound not mixed with anything else. Pure substances can be identified by their melting points and boiling points, because they melt and boil at specific temperatures. This means, number one, that I can look up the temperature in a data book, and number two, that that substance will melt and boil sharply at that temperature, whereas an impure substance might melt or boil over a range of temperatures, and these wouldn't match the data book value. A formulation is a mixture that's been designed as a useful product, and the amount of the substances in that mixture are going to be really carefully controlled. There are seven examples of formulations listed in your specification, and these are fuels, cleaning agents, paints, medicines, alloys, fertilisers and foods. The purpose of chromatography is to separate and analyse mixtures of fluids, for instance the different colours in an ink that could be separated by paper chromatography. All types of chromatography have a stationary phase which stays still and a mobile phase which moves. So in paper chromatography the stationary phase is the chromatography paper and in paper chromatography the mobile phase is the solvent. Substances are separated according to whether they're more attracted to the stationary phase or the mobile phase. In paper chromatography this comes down to how soluble they are in the particular solvent being used. An RF value stands for retention factor, and this is a numerical measure of how well retained that substance is. It always comes between 0 and 1. To calculate an RF value, you divide the distance travelled by the substance by the distance travelled by the solvent. The latter of these will always be a larger number, and therefore the RF value will always be between 0 and 1. A compound can have different RF values in different solvents. This can be really useful when you're trying to differentiate between two substances that have the same solubility in one solvent. So for instance, you could have two different inks that don't separate in water, but they do separate in ethanol. The chromatogram produced by a pure substance will have a single mark for that substance. The first step in setting up a paper chromatogram is to draw a start line at the bottom of the chromatography paper, and it's really important that this is drawn in pencil. You then need to apply the sample and also the standards that you're going to compare it to, to the start line. And then you place the chromatography paper into the solvent, making sure that that solvent touches the bottom of the paper, but not that start line. You need to wait for some time to allow the solvent to rise up the paper, taking the different inks with it. And then once it's progressed far enough, you need to remove the chromatogram and dry it out. And then you can measure the distances and calculate the RF value. To analyse the chromatogram, we want to look at how many different spots there are in the sample and also compare these to the standards. So the first thing I would be saying when looking at this chromatogram is that the sample contains three different spots and therefore it contains three pure substances, such as three different inks. Then by comparing it to the standards, I would say that this sample contains A and it contains C and it also contains one other ink that hasn't been shown here. The final topic in this unit for combined science is the gas tests, so you need to be able to describe all four of these. To test for hydrogen, you take a lit splint and you ignite the gas and you listen for a squeaky pop as it burns rapidly. To test for oxygen, you also need a splint, but this time it needs to be glowing and the glowing splint will relight. To test for chlorine, you use damp litmus paper and it must be damp to get the mark. This will bleach white. To test for carbon dioxide, you bubble the gas through lime water or shake it with lime water, knowing of course that lime water is calcium hydroxide, not anything to do with citrus fruit, and the lime water will go white and cloudy as it forms a calcium carbonate precipitate. Flame tests can be used to indicate the presence of metal cations. To carry out the flame test, you need to clean a nichrome wire, firstly by putting it into the flame to remove any dust, and then by putting it into some hydrochloric acid. And then you take that slightly damp wire and put it either into a solid salt sample or into a solution. And then you hold that wire 
right at the edge of a colourless part of a Bunsen burner roaring flame and you observe the colour. You can't use a flame test to identify mixtures of ions because the two different colours will just obscure each other, particularly if one of them is something very pale like the lilac flame of a potassium compound. Compounds that contain lithium will burn with a crimson flame. Compounds that contain sodium will burn with a yellow flame. Compounds that contain potassium will burn with a lilac flame. Compounds containing calcium will burn with an orange red or brick red flame. And compounds containing copper will burn with a green flame. If you have a mixture of ions and cannot use flame tests, then instead you could use flame emission spectroscopy. In this test, the sample is still passed through a flame, but then the light that comes out is passed through a spectroscope. And this gives it a feed out that is called a line spectrum. Three advantages of an instrumental method like this are that they are accurate, so they give an answer that's very close to the true value. They're rapid, so they work very quickly, and they're sensitive, so they can identify very, very small concentrations of a substance. These six cations can be distinguished by using a small amount and then an excess amount of sodium hydroxide. The first three of these, aluminium, calcium and magnesium ions, will all produce a white precipitate when sodium hydroxide is added. However, when more sodium hydroxide is added until it's in excess, the aluminium precipitate will re-dissolve, whereas the other two will not. The copper 2 plus ions will produce a blue precipitate, the iron 2 plus ions will produce a green precipitate and the iron 3 plus ions will produce a brown precipitate. The ionic equation for the reaction of calcium ions with hydroxide ions is Ca2 plus plus 2 hydroxide ions react to form Ca brackets OH brackets 2. The test for carbonates is to use a small amount of acid and then bubble the resulting gas through lime water, which will then turn cloudy as it produces a white calcium carbonate precipitate. To test for sulphate ions, you use barium chloride, but first you need to add a small amount of hydrochloric acid. This hydrochloric acid will break down any carbonate ions that are also in the solution, preventing a false positive. You couldn't use sulfuric acid because by doing this you would be adding sulphate ions to the substance you're trying to test. To test for halide ions you use silver nitrate but first you use a small amount of nitric acid. The acid is added like in the sulphate test to remove any carbonates and also any sulphates as these would give false positives. Nitric acid is used rather than hydrochloric acid because nitric acid doesn't contain any ions that you're not already using. The hydrogen ions are already in the solution, the nitrate ions are already in the silver nitrate. Whereas if you used hydrochloric acid, you'd be introducing chloride ions and then you'd get a positive test of chloride ions. Chloride ions, bromide ions and iodide ions all produce a precipitate when silver nitrate is added, but these differ in colour. So chloride ions produce a white precipitate, bromide ions produce a cream precipitate and iodide ions produce a yellow precipitate. There's no result for fluoride ions because silver fluoride is soluble so it doesn't precipitate out. Thank you very much for watching and I hope that you found that useful. If you did then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE chemistry videos coming soon.